Welcome to tonight. Hallelujah. We're hoping that you are enjoying your Wednesday. Did everybody have a great Wednesday? It was not another Monday. Amen. I proclaim that in Jesus' name over you. It was not another Monday. You are at church to magnify and glorify Jesus. Yes, you'll get with me in just a minute. I can hear you online. You're amen to me right now. We're really glad you're tuning in tonight. Welcome to Bethesda Church. Uh, we would just ask that you would just be in prayer and be joining with us tonight in spirit and in heart in the way we magnify God. We love you so much. And uh, tonight, if you stand to your feet and as you do, turn to someone right now and say, I love you in the Lord. But I know that the Lord loves you more. Yes, let's worship God tonight with this worship team. Amen. Amen. You guys ready to praise the Lord tonight? Say, oh yeah. I say, you ready to praise the Lord tonight? All right, here we go. Sing that again, come on. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. We wait on the Lord our God. You reign forever. Our hope, our strong
Father. You know, I've always heard that verse in the Bible where it talks about they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. A couple of years ago, I was listening to a pastor preach that and he was talking about waiting on the Lord. And he says, you know, a lot of people think that, that um, you know, when it talks about waiting on the Lord, like you're waiting around, waiting on the Lord to do something. You know that? But it says, well, as you wait upon the Lord, he will renew your strength. Well, if, you, if you're waiting around, just waiting, you're not really burning up all that strength. But when you take the weight upon the Lord, as, as to, to, like when you go to a restaurant and you are waited upon. So as you wait upon the Lord, as you serve the Lord, as you give everything to the Lord, that's when he gives you strength. That's when you roll in here on Wednesday night and say, Lord, I've been serving you all week long. <laughs> I've been waiting on you all week long. Well, now renew me. Give me strength. Amen. Hallelujah. Father, we give you glory, honor, and praise in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. It's who you are. 
You're a good, good father. It's who you are. Come on, tell him tonight. It's who you are. Come on, sing that again. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. And we thank you tonight, Father, that you are more than just our creator but you are the lover of our soul. And we are more than simply stats on the page, but we are children of the Most High. And we are joint heirs with Jesus Christ, your Son. And you have told us that everything that belongs to Him belongs to us. And I'm grateful tonight that my confidence and my faith is in a God and a Father that cannot fail, that has never failed. And I trust you with my life completely and entirely. So we lift our voices in praise on this Wednesday night to give you glory and give you honor. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth in this house, in this heart, as it is in heaven. We call forth the kingdom of heaven into our lives, into our living. And we thank you, Lord, that you have promised that you would never leave us nor forsake us. You are there with us every step of the way. Praise his name forever. Anybody love him tonight, say amen. Amen. I'm glad that you're here. I'd like the team to hold steady just a second. We may go back into part of that song and just exalt. Exalt the Lord, exalt his name. You know, one beautiful thing about when Jesus was here and he called his disciples, he became their overseer. He became their shelter. He became their, their shield. He protected them. And it's interesting to me that just hours before he knew he was to go to the cross, that in John 17, he prayed a priestly prayer over these, these 12 that he loves so dearly and so deeply. He prayed to his father. I just want to read to you just from this prayer just for a moment. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. And then he said, I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were. Yours they were. And you gave them to me. And they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me. And they have received them and have come to know in truth that I came from you. And they have believed that you sent me. And I am praying for them. And I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me. For they are yours. All mine are yours and yours are mine. And I am glorified. I am glorified in them. <laughs> so every single day that we live, covered by the blood of a spotless lamb, 
His glory is in us. So in every word, in every deed, and every action, we should glorify Him in the world. We should make Him bigger, larger. We should be a reflection of Jesus. In every, and how many knows that we have to work at that every day? I have to work at that every day. But I don't want the mirror of my life to be blemished and to portray a distorted visual of Jesus. I don't want to be a hindrance or a stumbling block to anyone that's trying to find truth. I want them to see truth in me. I want them to see Christ in me, the hope of glory. So I want them to just sing the last part of that song. And Would you in your heart on this Wednesday evening unplug from all the responsibilities and all the plans you have for tomorrow because how many believe that he deserves our, our undivided attention tonight? Amen. Because he is a good, good father. Sing it one more time. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. Perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. To us, you're a good, good father. It's who you are. Father, we are grateful tonight that you don't love us based on our performance, based upon our abilities, based upon our giftings, based upon our position in life, the titles that we've amassed. But God, you just love us because of who we are. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You loved us as a prodigal. It was your loving kindness that drew us home, that kept the Father on the front porch. We thank you for your loving kindness, oh God. So Lord, as we give this service to prayer, calling on your name, presenting our petitions before you, I pray, God, you will lead us by the Holy Spirit, that we will not pray amiss to consume it upon our own lust, but we will pray in accordance to the will of the Father. Knowing if your words abide in us and we abide in you, we can ask what we will and it shall be done for us. So God, open the heavens above us, we pray in Jesus' wonderful name. And all the church said, amen. You may be seated. So I want you to get comfortable tonight, but not too comfortable, okay? Tonight is 
we have one focus in mind, and that is to pray. How many believe that prayer is still a vital part of who we should be about? And so I just want to, I want to set this up, and then we're going to just we're going to be praying. Different ones are going to be coming, praying for different ministries in our church that God has given to us. And, and guys, I'll tell you, we, we are so blessed to have a church like Bethesda. I know there's a lot of great churches in Oklahoma City and around the world. But I am so grateful to be a part of this family that's headed for heaven and making the trip together with you. And so we're, we are so glad that you are here. Great service this last Sunday. What a sweet spirit of the Lord. Our guest speakers, Gardo and Jordania, they both told us at lunch and even texted me, emailed me yesterday how much they were refreshed and renewed in their own spirit as they were worshiping with us. Amen. The Holy Spirit just has that way of doing it, doesn't he? Amen. So let me just take a quick survey. You are here as a believer, but in your life living for the Lord, there have been times that God has come through for you, answered prayers that if he would not have moved in your behalf, you would be in big trouble right now. Let me see your hand. Probably all of us should lift both hands and all five, all 10 toes. Maybe you have more than five toes. All of us are recipients of the power and the privilege of prayer. And the truth is that none of us are here by reason of our own making. But we are here because somebody stood in the gap. And they made up the hedge and they prayed for us. They prayed for us. A mom or dad or grandma or a nana or an Uncle Jim or a Aunt Lucy or Cousin Jack. We are, we are all recipients because someone believe that God could make a difference in our lives. How many thankful that there was that person in your life or those persons that never gave up on you? They kept believing that things could be different. Amen. So our focus this evening is to pray Bethesda, to pray Bethesda. In Leonard Ravenhill's book, an old revivalist, and if you've ever read any of his material, he, he does not mince any words. He doesn't try to flower it up. He just hits you right between the eyes. And I would challenge you to do that, to read his book. But in his book that he wrote entitled Revival God's Way, he makes this powerful statement, prayer is not a preparation for the battle. It is the battle. It is the battle. We will not win this war, this struggle that we are in as a people, as a church, as a nation without prayer. I'm just telling you, we can't preach it good enough. We can't sing it loud enough to invite the presence of God to move in a way that we, we must pray this thing down, pray this thing through. There's some miracles that will never happen with you standing up. The miracles will happen as we fall on our knees before God. Because prayer is not a preparation for the battle. It is the battle. That's why Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 10, 3, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're what? Mighty in God for pulling down every stronghold, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. The truth of the matter is we probably need less preaching and more praying. We've been preached to death. We just need to take what we know and put it into practice on our knees. 
Prayer is more than simply words recited, but a weapon realized. Prayer is one of our greatest weapons. That's why Apostle Paul, in his battle plan for victory, included prayer as a believer's weapon. Ephesians 6. Finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, Stand, stand firm. Stand therefore having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and the shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. And in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And don't forget, praying at all times. At what times? At all times. I will pray without ceasing. Praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. So as I was reading this again today, it just... It's like the Holy Spirit just kind of breathed this this truth into my heart. The belt of truth can only be buckled in prayer. The breastplate of righteousness can only be worn in effective prayer. The shoes of peace can only be fitted through prayer. The shield of faith can only be carried by prayer. The helmet of salvation can only be secured in prayer. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, can only be lifted up by the power of prayer. So pray at all times, in all situations, in all circumstances, in all struggles, because prayer is not a preparation for the battle. It is the battle. It is the battle. One writer penned these powerful words about prayer Prayer is a force. It touches eternal powers and sets them in motion. It moves God, our God, into action. It is the inner ministry before God's face, which is the ministry that is feared most by Satan himself because prayer is a divine force the unfolding of an intense spiritual labor that results in great visible kingdom gains. Amen. Let me just repeat myself. There's some miracles, there's some prodigals that will never happen, never come home outside of the avenue of this force called prayer. Amen. He goes on to write, it is imperative for Satan that you do not pray because prayer interferes with his power and disturbs his plans and destroys his kingdom. Amen. You know, all through the word, God encourages his people. Lift up your voice. Shout unto the Lord with a voice of triumph. And I believe that our voice in prayer is a powerful weapon. You may disagree, but I don't believe that Satan can read my thoughts, discern my thoughts, but he can discern my words. Life or death is the power of the tongue. What I've seen across the, the land is that Satan has, he's convinced us that we can just, we can just meditate. And there's a place for meditation, but there's also a place in the tabernacle of God, in our prayer closet, that we once again find our voice in prayer. Some would say, well, why get loud? Because God isn't deaf. Well, he's not nervous either. 
You're not going to make him nervous when you lift your voice in prayer. Amen. You know, when I have time with the staff to pray, I, I, maybe it's selfish, but I want to hear them pray. When we come together as the body, I want to hear you pray. Because when you verbalize what's burning in your heart and stirring in your spirit, Satan recognizes it. He hears that. Come on now. And you have power in the words that you speak over the enemy of your soul. If we just sit there with our mouth closed, just meditating, that's all good. But Satan, he's not put to flight because it's the word of God verbalized and declared that causes him heartburn and puts him in retreat. Amen. I believe that. Am I going to be able to heal you tonight? Come on now. Your voice is a weapon. Your voice is a weapon. Hallelujah. So right now, would you just lift your voice and just magnify the Lord. Just love Him. Just praise Him. Father, we just lift our voice unashamedly to declare our allegiance and our loyalty and our love to you, our God, our Savior, our Redeemer. Father, be lifted up in our words. Be lifted up in our declarations of faith. God, we we just come before you believing that you are the words that we speak, the words of the living God, the promises of God that are yea and amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You know, I, I, I've shared with you several times my, my personal declaration over my life every day. And I don't do that. I don't like... I come under the closet of prayer of the house of God and I just say... I am healthy and I am whole. I'm from above, not beneath. I'm the head, not the tail. And your favor and your blessing literally chases me down and overtakes me. And the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in me and is speaking resurrection power in every part of my body. I am fearfully and wondrously made and no weapon that's formed against me will ever prosper. And if you are for me, who can be against me? I don't whisper that. I declare that over my life. It's time that we start declaring that over our life, our marriages, our families, our home, our careers, declaring the promises of God. Drawing a line in the sand and saying, as for me and my house, come on now. We are unashamedly blood-bought and spirit-filled. Praise God. Amen. (laughs) Amen. Peter Taylor Forsythe said, We do not pray in order to live Christian life, but rather we live Christian life in order to pray. What a privilege we have. What a communion that God has given to us. For the Lord is at hand, so do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and guard your minds in Christ Jesus. Call to me, and I will answer you. And so you great and mighty things, which you do not know. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut the door, pray to your Father who is in secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And David said, in my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried out to my God. And he heard my voice. He heard my voice from the temple. And my cry came up before him, even into his ears. So God's okay with you getting loud. Amen. Therefore, Jesus said, I say to you, what Whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. So rejoice always and pray without ceasing. 
in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Praise the Lord. So, Father, as we enter into this time of praying for your church, we lift our voices to you. And may our cry and our pleas come into your ears. And may you hear the beating of our heart and the cry from our mouth. And may you respond as you always do. And so, Lord, I pray for a spirit of intercession. Hallelujah. To grip our hearts. Give us a burden to pray. Do something eternally significant in this house, in our hearts. Give to us a fresh revelation of the power and the privilege of just talking to you and you communing with us. And we thank you for it in advance. In Jesus' name, amen. So the first thing that we're going to do this evening is we're going to pray for the needs of Bethesda. And we have, we have many needs. But we serve a big God, a powerful Father. Many of you have been given a list of these needs, and we would encourage you, don't leave them on the pews, but please take them home with you. And in your daily devotion, in your daily times of communication with the Lord, just pray over these needs because I still believe there is healing and miracles that happen because we pray. So I'm just going to go down through this list, and then I'm going to have my wife, Vicki, she's going to come and pray over these needs. Praying for Crystal Stuckey, scheduled to have intensive surgery on her hip tomorrow. We pray that God's presence, his healing virtue will go with her, and Brian, and their family. Debbie Dunn having a heart scan next Thursday. Carly Mankins recovering from surgery. He had a knee replacement and he's struggling with a range of motion. We pray for Harley. Robert Adams, we're so glad that Robert and Karen are back tonight and he has experienced a lot of health issues and want to pray for the nerve pain in his left arm, his hand and fingers and just pray that God will restore that hand total health. Tim Wilkerson, this is Dorothy's husband, recovering from cancer surgery. David Stuckey, him and Irma that we love dearly, recovering, rehabbing, getting his strength back, proceeding with back surgery. He's been in the hospital more in the last few weeks or months than he's probably in his lifetime. Pastor Arlie Branson, who who we miss so terribly and has been out of commission with, with back issues, severe back issues. We're so glad to have Patty here this evening. And, and we, we pray often for, for, for your husband, for Arlie, because we know that he wants to be out and about. And our prayers are for complete restoration. But Bill Tomlin, rehabbing, recovering from back surgery on September the 24th. Those needing a healing miracle, Loretta Simmons, Loretta and Rick were part of our church for many, many years. And um, Loretta had several, I think two strokes that has left her almost bedridden, can't walk, has a little hearing and eyesight. She needs a miracle from God. Claudia McAllister still recovering from nine months of shingles. Talked to her just a couple days ago and she's she asked me this question. She said, Pastor, does, does God ever abandon someone? She's just being dead honest. Nine months of just excruciating pain. It's a pastor's wife. And she was asking, Pastor, does God ever abandon anyone? So let's pray that God will just wrap his arms around Claudia and just remind her that he has promised, I will never, never leave you. I will never abandon you. Bring healing there. 
Ben and his wife, Ben Tipton, recovering from injuries. They, they, they were involved in a car accident a couple months, a month and a half ago or so. Ward Robinette still having issues with his heart, possibly AFib. Rita King been been in the hospital ICU for months. They're moving her to a nursing home in Yukon. Letha Emmons still struggling with a heart, being in AFib after three and a half months. Devonna Newton having sinus surgery. And after having sinus surgery a couple months ago, she's developed staph infection in the sinus cavities, which is very dangerous. Kenda Kimmel suffering with headaches at night. Her hand that she had surgery on is still very sore and uncomfortable. We pray for this young lady. It's good to have mom and dad and family here. We pray for you. Hey, Kenda, how you doing? Love you, girl. Praying. God's able. He's bigger. Yes, he is. I received word right before service. Glenda Palomina's mother broke her shoulder. It's in tremendous pain. Our prayers are for Glenda's mom. Those that are struggling with cancer, Buck Foster, Lorraine's husband. Lorraine's here tonight. Our prayers for Buck. Denise Jennings, Charles Jennings' wife. What a trooper that she's been. Billy Medeiros, back in the hospital for the next 24 days. He's prepared for bone marrow transplant. So we pray for Billy and, and, and his wife, Darla, that God will minister to them. Those that are struggling with COVID, Ron Marler, Tanya's dad, Tanya Allen's father, has a lot of health complications. Our prayers with Ron. Mark Fitzgerald, our missionary to Mexico, and for the last few years has, has been here in Oklahoma and um, has been in the hospital for, for weeks and is still struggling. Jolinda Bittner's aunt and uncle are both in ICU with COVID. Ron and Fisher's teacher, Ms. Barris, um, is struggling with, with issues. Matthew Lemons is very sick with the virus. That I'm not sure exactly what the diagnosis is yet. But how many is glad that there's there's always a praise report? Amen. We need these. Rita Fisher's brother, her, his name is Randy, went missing a week ago. He has some emotional, mental issues. Couldn't find him. They found him. He's home. He's safe. And our, our thanksgiving to God for that. Donnie Scott, a dear friend of ours, has been in the hospital in ICU since July the 31st with COVID, the pneumonia, that expect him to live. And he's going home, I believe, tomorrow. Somebody shout amen. God is good. God is faithful. Praise the Lord. Sandy Carlson received a call from Lyndon Sandy a couple of days ago, and, and uh, they're waiting for the results of a, a biopsy. As you know, Sandy's been struggling with cancer, and she's just barely getting around. And uh, got a call from Sandy last night. The results of the biopsy was there was absolutely no cancer. Put your hands together and bless him. Amen. Praise God is greater than cancer. He's greater. They did discover she has a growth that is going to require tubes in her bladder that she was discouraged about. I just told her, I said, Sandy, if God can heal cancer, he can take care of this growth. Because I believe what God starts, he always finishes. Amen. So our prayers and our praise with Sandy. Amen. And then how many here, there are prodigals in your family that, that you pray for every day that need to come home to the Father's house? Would you just lift that prodigal to the Lord? Amen. So I'm going to ask Miss Vicki to come, and she's going to pray over these requests, these needs tonight. just a a thing or two here first I want to stir up your faith I want you to stir up your faith I don't want empty words none of us want to take the time to have empty words and and things that we that we uh, know are ineffective but we want to be that one that prays that effective fervent prayer that there is a great result from and so I just want to stir up your mind for a minute when I put the list together that's one of my responsibilities is to try to keep up with 
the prayer needs to keep up with those in the church and what they need and to disseminate that information on the prayer team and to the prayer teams and different things. And when I put this together the last few months, I have to be honest with you. Every time I put it together, I'm overwhelmed. I look at the needs and I just think, what is going on here? We've never had so many needs, serious needs, not, not just uh, little things, which little things matter to God, but I'm just overwhelmed. And so I bring that need before the Lord. And uh, when I today put it together and I was praying over the list, he brought two situations to me in the Bible. And I just want to tell you, I want to remind you of them and I hope they'll stir up your faith. But I want you to see how two people in the Bible handle some situations. The first one he reminded me of was King Hezekiah. He was the king of Judah, and a, an ungodly king came against him and sent him a letter and told him what all he was going to do to him and what all he was going to do to his country and that he was coming for him, and it was there was no way out. And so I want you to look at a minute, and I want to tell you what Hezekiah did with that. It says, Hezekiah received the letter from the messenger and he read it. Then he went up to the temple of the Lord and he spread that letter out before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed to the Lord, the God of Israel, who was enthroned between the cherubs. And he said, you alone are God over all the kingdoms of this earth. You have made the heaven and the earth. Give ear, Lord, and hear. And look at what this man has said. Look what this devil has said to your people. And I love the fact that we are serving not a God made by hand, uh, idols made by hand. We're serving a God that sees and hears and knows. And he knows every one of these needs. He knows what's going on in these needs. He knows how the enemy has come against these families. And he delights in it. But we don't have to stay that way. Then he said, now, Lord God, deliver us from his hand so that all the kingdoms of the earth are going to know that you alone are the Lord, our God. And then the other uh, story that came to my mind was uh, in Second Chronicles, the story of Jehoshaphat. And you probably remember it, but uh, a, an army had arrayed itself against the children of Israel, a large army an army that was so big that there was no way that they knew they were outnumbered. So Jehoshaphat, I want to read you a little of this story. A vast army is coming against you. He was alarmed. He resolved to inquire of the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast for all Judah. The people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. And then it goes on to say, he told the Lord, if calamity comes upon us, whether the sword of judgment, a, pla a plague, or famine, we're going to stand in your presence before the temple that bears your name, and we're going to cry out to you in our distress, and you're going to save us. And he said, we do not know what to do about this, Lord. We don't know what to do about this, Lord, but our eyes are upon you knowing that you have the ability to fix this. So I want to remind you of a couple of scriptures. I'm going to remind you the effectual fervent prayer. Fervent. Prayer of the righteous men avails much. And I want you to ask you if you would take these needs as seriously. Some of these people are here tonight. And I'm telling you when it's your need, it matters. The times when Craig was in the hospital after the stroke and even when we recently had COVID, there's times you can't pray for yourself. You're just too sick. But you you just rely on and hope that the church will be the one that will fervently hold you up in prayer and, and faithfully pray for you. So that's what we're gonna do tonight. So I'm gonna ask you, I'm not just gonna pray, but you're gonna be a part of this. I want you to stand with me if you don't mind. And I want you to take your list and I want you to do one of two things. I want you to either lay your hand on it and, and pray over these needs. We're going to just lay it. There's so many needs, but God sees every one of them. He knows every one of them deeper than we know, the details we don't know. Or I want you to take it 
And I want you just to hold it to the Lord and I want you to show it to him. And I want you to tell him, this is what the enemy's doing. The enemy came to steal, kill and destroy, but he came to bring life and life more abundantly. So we're gonna bring these needs before the Lord. And I want you to go with me right now before the throne. Father, in the name of the Lord, we come before you. Father, we lay these needs before you. We want you, Lord, to look. Look what the enemy has done. Look, Lord, what the enemy has done in the lives of so many of our people. God, look how the enemy has come against us to kill, steal, and destroy. Look at it, Lord. And then, Father, I ask you to put a stop to it. I ask you to do what no man can do. Lord, I ask you, as we lay these before you, that you would be exalted. God, that you would be exalted among this people, that there would be healing. You said when two or three gather together and unite their hearts together, God, that you are there and you are hearing. And I know you're hearing us right now, Father. We're uniting our hearts and ask for healing for these people, for every one of these needs. We rebuke cancer. We rebuke heart disease and AFib. We tell these hearts to come back into rhythm. We tell this cancer to go. We tell these limbs that need to heal and these bones and sinew that need to heal that they would come together and heal in the name of the Lord Jesus. And Father, we just wait in expectancy for what you're going to do. We know, oh God, that you are the God above all gods. You are the Father above all fathers. You're a good, good Father and you're the Lord of all. And everything has to bow before you, Lord. There's nothing, not one plan or scheme of the enemy that can stand before you. Not one scheme of the enemy has any power over your people. And so, Lord, we rebuke every scheme of the enemy. We rebuke every plan of the enemy to take out his people, to take out the intercessors. Lord, many of these people on this list are intercessors, and you know it. And God, the enemy is taking away their ability to intercede because of their sickness. And Father, we rebuke that in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we speak the power and the might, the healing, the hope, and the help of Jesus Christ in every one of these situations. Father, we expect to hear of the miracles that you've done. Lord, we will be faithful to lift our brothers and sisters to you as if it were our own selves. And Father, you called this church, you alone, 20 years ago. You called us to be a place of healing. You said Bethesda is a place of healing. And Father, I pray right now, you would manifest the very DNA you have called us to. The DNA of a church that is a healing pool that Christ is in and his spirit troubles the waters in. In the name of the Lord Jesus, let your healing flow through this body, flow through this place, Lord, not for our glory, but God, that you would be lifted up and that all men would see you, God, through your miracles, through your healing, that you would become more visible and that you would become more worshiped among your people. And we thank you now for what you're going to do in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Oh, it's so good to be in the house of the Lord. So good to be here. I have the privilege tonight to pray over the seniors. And what a precious group of people we have here at Bethesda, our seniors, and outside of our church also, the seniors. But today as I was in my study time, I was praying for some needs of our seniors as I was calling them today and checking on them. And I went to Isaiah chapter 43, and I want you to remember that God has not forgotten you. And that you are never too old. You are never too old not to be used by God. When I was a young little girl, to when we went into ministry, and for 45 years of ministry, 
when I had a need or a loss and when I lost my daughter, I went to the seniors of the church because I knew they were prayer warriors. And I knew that they had paved the way and paved the trail for me to be able to walk where I walked in the Lord. And so tonight I want you to be encouraged, but I want you to realize body of Christ that we've got some seniors that have been shut in since March. They have not been out of their nursing facilities. They have not been out of their homes. There are some who are so full of fear that they don't, do not want to come out. And they have pre-existing conditions that cause them, just as it is in my home right now, that he cannot come out. The doctors have said, do not go out. And so we need to understand something tonight. Prayer is the most important thing we can do. And it doesn't matter how old you are, you can pray. And God answers the prayer of the seniors, but your name has not been forgotten. Isaiah 43 says, but now this is what the Lord says, who created you, O Jacob. He formed you, O Israel. Fear not, for I have redeemed you, and I have summoned you by name, and you are mine. And when you walk through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. And when you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, the Savior. I gave Egypt for your ransom. Cush and Seba in your stead, since you are precious and honored in my sight because I love you. And in verse 5, he says, do not be afraid for I am with you. And this is what a lot of our seniors have been praying for. And I want you to hear this. I will bring your children from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up and to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone is called, who is called by my name, who I created for my glory, whom I formed and I made. Can you give God praise tonight? Our seniors are praying, and we need to pray for them tonight, that God will strengthen them, that God will heal them, that God will uphold them, and let them remember that God has summoned them by name, and that he knows where they're at tonight. Can you lift your hands and begin to praise the Lord and begin to pray over the seniors? Father, we come before you tonight, thankful for your word. Your word is yea and amen. Your word is true. Your word is the the only thing that we can lean on and God as you have lifted up the seniors who carry God the foundation of Bethesda that you will bless them that you will use them that you will strengthen them that you will take any fear from them in the name of Jesus that you will cover them with your blood that you will keep them well, that you will heal them. God, I pray, Lord, that they will realize how important they are to the kingdom. If it were not for them, I would not be standing here tonight because of the prayer of seniors. And God, I pray tonight that you would just touch them, revive them, heal them. Give them a song in the morning and a song at night. Give them the word in the morning and the word at night. God, give them a praise upon their lips and let them know with every breath that they have that their prayers are important and that you hear them, that you bottle their tears, that you see Sister Claudia tonight, God. Lord, heal them. Lord, redeem them. Lord, and bring our children home tonight in the name of Jesus. Now, Lord, we commit the seniors to you, and we pray that you will give them a double blessing, God, that you will fill them so full of your Holy Spirit that it will wake them up at night speaking in an unknown tongue unto the Savior, praying the perfect will of God. And, Lord, we thank you for it tonight. I thank you for it. I thank you for every senior. And, God, I pray that you will give them the peace that passes all of their understanding and guard their hearts in Christ Jesus, that they can come 
come back to the house of God and that they can worship freely with us in Jesus' precious name. And everybody said a great big amen. amen. Tonight we're going to pray for our young people, and I know that uh, many of us have a direct connection to our a young person somewhere in this church. And if you don't, that's okay. As we've already expressed and told you through many, many opportunities, just extend your heart. Let your heart be used in prayer tonight. So let's magnify the Lord together. Father, you're so good, and you are worthy of all praise in this room. I thank you for your spirit that is here hovering over us tonight. Father, you hear us. You know us. You know us by name, Lord God, and we glorify you, Father. Glory to God in the highest. And I pray that, Lord, as you be exalted, you would draw all men unto yourself, Father, in this room. God, tonight for our young people, I pray a specific prayer over them. That, Lord God, you would begin to send that the Holy Spirit would go and march around them, Father. You reminded me Sunday night about Joshua, Father. And I believe, God, as the Holy Spirit would march around them, strongholds would begin to be broken. Lord, the attacks of the enemy over our young persons tonight will no longer affect their minds or their hearts or their identity, Lord God. Father, these things belong to you. And so I pray over those things that God, what belong to you will return unto you. Father, march around them with the Holy Spirit. And so that when they begin to feel your presence, let them come back to you. Let them draw unto you, Lord. Father, I believe that if we would submit ourselves to you, God, and we will resist the devil, he will flee. And in the name of Jesus, help us to draw unto you so that we, you would draw near to us. Lord, for our teenagers tonight that are struggling, Father, at home, they, they see many things going on. I know that, God, your truth can lead them and guide them. Father, give them a hunger and a passion for your word. Lord, let them not be satisfied. And I know that they will be wondering why there is nothing that can satisfy their soul. But I believe, Father, that someone, some way, Lord God, you will draw them, you will speak to them, and they will be drawn unto the word. Lord, as they become students of the word of God, let it be accountable for every situation. God, I believe, Father, tonight that as they come unto you, you would not leave them orphanless, Lord God. You would arise inside of them. You would awake their spirits. You would awaken that heart that they had for you in the early days of their salvation. God, let them not grow cold anymore, Father. But I pray that the Holy Spirit will be their passion, will be their fire. Lord God, there are students that have left this church. They were here at one time, but I pray for that student, God, who has gone wayward, and I believe that the love of the Father still calls out to them, and I believe that the love of the Father is still waiting for them. Lord, help us to show them that love. Help us to live in that love, Lord God, so that these young people, Father, will see what we have, see our good deeds, Father, and that they may come running back to glorify their Father in heaven. Jesus, these students belong to you, and I believe that the cry of this generation will save a nation but God they must turn unto you they must turn back to you Lord so Lord let this not be another generation that knows not the ways of God or the works of God but Father show yourself to be strong and mighty Lord I believe Father that these teenagers love you Lord, let them no longer be under the shadow of grandma, grandpa, mom, or dad. But Father, raise them up to another level. That Lord, that they must put their faith into action. God, there must be an account, Father, in their spirit and in their soul. God, for what they are going to do for the glory of their God. And Lord God, if they truly love you, Father, let them obey. Let them seek you, Father. And let them shine brighter than anything that ever has ever been seen in this dark nation. God, my passion is stirred tonight and I want so much Father revival to begin but I believe Lord God that our hearts must repent and Lord God we must turn to you and so I pray that over our young people Father no longer let them just be satisfied with coming to church but God let them begin to see the relationship and the value that they have with you Lord oh God tonight thank you for our young people 
Let them be the strength, Father, behind this movement. I believe that, God, you can use their youthfulness, Father, for your glory. Lord God, I believe that, Father, through the teaching of the word and the, and the examples that are in this church, they will be a mighty witness for you, Father. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity to minister unto them. I pray, Lord, for our pastors and for, for Lanisa, God, as we are trying our very best, Lord, to lead at this time. God, these young people are so impressionable. Give us the strength and the example that we need, Father, to lead forward and to lead with integrity, with courage and strength. Thank you so much. Thank you, Father, that you have never failed and you never will. I love you tonight. And I worship your holy name, God, because it is in your holiness, Father, that we will truly see you and you will do great things in the midst of this young generation. In Jesus' name, I believe it. Amen. Amen. Yes, God. Yes, God. Yes, God. I get to pray over our younger kids, and I'm going to include the nursery. I think Melanie's in here. But, um, and I just want to read a scripture real quick. I promise it won't be too long. But it's Mark 10, um, 11. And then, so it says, One day some parents brought their children to Jesus so he could touch and bless them. But the disciples scolded the parents for bothering him. When Jesus saw what was happening, he was angry with his disciples. He said to them, Let the children come to me. Don't stop them, for the kingdom of God belongs to those who are like these children. I tell you the truth. Anyone who doesn't receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. Then he took the children in his arms and placed his hands on their heads and blessed them. God, we just thank you for our kids. We thank you for every single one of them. We know that they have been called. We know that you have placed a purpose and a divine calling on their life already. God, we know that they are going to rise up and do things for you that we have not even seen and that they don't even know are coming. God, we pray right now that you would place your hedge of protection around them. God, we pray that wherever they go, in their school, their neighborhood, in their community, God, we pray that you would guard their heart, their mind against the evil that the world is throwing at them. God, we ask that you would open their mind and bring back to their memory these seeds that have already been planted. God, they know the truth. They have been poured into by the people, the examples in this church. We ask that you would help them to fight the evil in this world, not with their own strength, but with the strength that we know comes from you and the confidence that comes from you. God, make them witnesses and give them the strength and the confidence to go out and to minister to those around them because it doesn't matter how old they are. All that matters is that they love you and that they are willing to share. Can I just say that years ago when revival came to Abundant Life over on 28th Independence, God was so gracious that he included the kids they were just as, as much a part of the move of God as any adult was. And I just believe our children have the capacity to know God, to experience His Spirit, His presence, to believe for miracles. One Sunday afternoon, as our church was winding down in the sanctuary, someone came to me and said, you've got to see this. I walked back to the fellowship hall where our kids' church was at. And kids were just strewn all across the floor. And every one of them were praying in tongues. And parents were literally picking up their kids, limp, speaking in tongues and carrying them to the car. Let us not discount what God wants to do in our kids. Amen. For as such is the kingdom of heaven. Amen. So, Father, do it again. Do it again. Do it again in our children, God. 
they wake up in the middle of the night declaring their love and their loyalty to you. Baptize them in the power of your spirit, Lord. Give them faith to lay hands on the sick and the sick recover as they walk in divine innocence and complete faith and trust in the God they've come to know. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Brother Dick, would you come? Pray over our leadership. Amen. God is good. Amen. Yes. We can look around on every side. Amen. And God is good. Yes. Yes. He never leaves us. When you hear somebody tell you that God has forgot about you, guess where that message came from? That's right. That is, right. That is not God. No. That is in direct conflict with what he has said in his word. I've been looking through the Bible, just the history of Israel up to this time. There's a lot more to happen in Israel's history. But I ran across First Chronicles chapter 29 and as I read that this morning early, in my devotional time. It was a change that was destined for Israel. Because David prayed in chapter 29 of 1 Chronicles for the people to bring and get excited about building the temple of God and from that time point from that time on it's been the same story we are in the process of building God's kingdom and we can't do that without strong leadership and I'm so thankful for the leadership that we have in our pastors I love them so much. Let's pray for our leadership team. Not only the upper level, but all the way down through the ministries that are done here for the building of the kingdom. Every teacher that stands before Four, five year old, the nurseries. Those are things that are being done in the capacity of leadership. I remember when I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior, and it was because I attended a nursery school. My parents were not saved. I called her Aunt Preston. She's buried in Rest Haven over here, but she's in heaven now. She came by and picked me up for Sunday school and took me to church with her. And ever since that time that I accepted Jesus, it was because someone took the opportunity, capitalized on that opportunity, and took me to church. And when we have teachers that spend their time before a class of children, before a congregation of children that is moved on by the Holy Spirit and slain in the Spirit, that's because someone took an opportunity to tell somebody about Christ. My prayer 
and we've heard it. Do it again, God. Yes. Yes, God. <laughs> what I want is I want it to be better than you've done it before. And I don't know how. I don't know how that would happen. Let's go to prayer. Father, we just thank you for your goodness. We thank you, God. You're, you are so glorious, so magnificent, so mighty. God, we thank you for what you have done thus far. And Lord, we're excited because we know that you're going to do mighty things again that are going to even be greater. I pray for our leadership teams, God, whatever ministry that they're in. I ask God that you would just empower them with the mighty Holy Spirit anew. God, I ask that you would help them. I pray that you would be with that area of ministry, dear God, that they are involved in. Lord, use that as an avenue to touch lives for Jesus. I pray, oh God, for our pastor, our senior pastor and his wife. I ask God that you would bless them. Lord, I pray that you would just help them and give them wisdom, guide them and direct them. Father, I pray that as we walk, God, every day, and their name comes to our mind, God, that we would breathe a prayer for them. I pray, God, for uh, each one of those, for Michael Branson. God, I ask that you would lift this man and, and encourage him and help him as he lives and he leads and he praises your name and leads the worship team. God, we lift you up. We praise you. You are mighty. And you never leave us. You never forsake us. Be with Josh, God, as he works and ministers to our young people. Father, there are those that will be touched in ministry here, God. And the, the young people that will carry on the torch of Christ. Oh, God, be with Michaela. Father, we ask you that you would help us. God, as we are awakened at night, and God, as somebody is laid upon our hearts, Lord, we would call out to you. Father, we may not know what they're going through at a given time, but God, we know that you have a timing, and your timing is right, and when we are awakened, and they're on our mind, we're need, we need to get out, and God, lift them to you. In the name of Jesus, thank you for this church. And God, we just bless your holy name forever. Amen. I would like for you to be seated, please. Not because I'm going to preach a long time. I wouldn't ask to do that. But when the pastor texted me and asked me to pray over the election for the coming year, coming up in just a little over 10 days, there's some things that God wants you to know. The one thing the church has neglected, and I'm just going to be honest with you, is the part that is necessary for victory in God. And that's fasting. We've come so far in our lives that some of us will say, well, I, I can't fast food because I'm where I'm at physically. Do you realize there's a lot of other things in your life that you could do without? To get on your knees or to get on a bedside or sit on a couch and begin to pray during the time you would be doing something else and spending that focused time with God. You know why that's important? In Matthew 14, I mean Matthew 17, Jesus tells us why. Do you remember the, the, little, the man that brought the son that had the seizures and he came to Jesus or he came to his disciples and they couldn't cast the demon out? Now I'm going to go against your traditional thinking here, but you listen to what Jesus says. 
when he gets down and the father addresses him and he does what he says, and he turns to the disciples, this is not the crowd, people, and he says, oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. And what did Jesus do? He rebuked the demon. And it came out of him. The child fell like as if he was dead, but then Jesus reached down and lifted him up. Now, the disciples came to him privately because they've already been humbled in front of the crowd and says, why could we not cast him out? Listen closely to what Jesus says. Because of your unbelief. Some translations say little faith. Hey, if they had little faith, they could have cast him out. Yo, you with me? Because Jesus goes on to say, I say to you, if you have faith as a grain of a mustard seed, that's small faith. You will say to this mountain, move from here to there and it'll move and nothing will be impossible for you. Where has the church moved a mountain lately? Gee, no lot of amens, praise the Lord yet, okay. And this is what he says, nothing will be impossible for you. Now listen to his next statement. And people have linked this to the wrong thing. This kind comes only out by prayer and fasting. Oh, he's talking about the demon. No, he's not. He had addressed what? Faith. You want faith to shut hell. You want faith to shut the mouth of the enemy. If you want faith to bring healing, then you better learn how to pray and fast. This kind of faith comes only out through prayer and fasting. So I want you to understand that. The church needs to come back and get the power of faith through fasting and prayer to move mountains because there's coming a storm. Makes no difference who gets elected. There's coming a storm. When COVID-19 hit, the Lord hit me the second day and said, watch, I've allowed the enemy to flex his muscle. And on the third day, he shut down the entire world. And he shut down the churches. He thought he had shut down God's people. But they began to meet in homes. They began to meet out on the beaches. They began to meet out in public parks. They began to meet outside of church. And mountains began to move. Healings began to happen. The first one that did this was out in California, called for through the social media for everybody to gather together on the beach. 5,000 people showed up. Healings took place with no one praying for anybody. Deliverance took place from addictions and sin. No one praying for anyone. Just praising and worshiping God. Praying and fasting. There's coming a storm. There's three things you'll learn about a storm. Better learn it now. They come for threefold. There is the purpose of God for the storm. In the midst of it, you're going to find the presence of God. But the clincher is, if you can get past and get to the purpose and then find the presence, then comes the power of God in the midst of the storm. Now, in our election time, it doesn't matter who, it matters what we're focused on, and that's the salvation of a nation and the deliverance of a nation and the mercy of God being shown to a nation and the blood of Jesus being poured out for the salvation of a nation. It's not about who is president, it's who is God and where is our faith. So Father, as we come tonight, we come with hearts focused on you. We come with faith stirred because of a meeting of Christians who come together in like mind with a God that we know 
who created all things, but who sent his son so that we would know him not as almighty God, but as almighty father, loving and good, bestowing upon his people the blessings of God, the promises of God, the salvation of God, the providence of God, the mercy and love of God, so that we would know we are serving a faithful God in the midst of our struggles. And it doesn't matter what happens. Father, we cry out for mercy on this nation. We cry for your mercy and the power of salvation to be shown through your people, the church. I pray that in the name of Jesus Christ, that you would give us wisdom. Let him who lacks that, let him ask of God who gives to all men liberally. We ask for wisdom, not just upon your church, but upon the people of this nation. We ask for knowledge, knowledge just about men, but knowledge of God to be bestowed upon this nation. A knowledge of knowing not about God, but knowing who you are in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, we ask for revelation, a revelation as to why the storm is here. It is here so the church can arise, arise, for your light has come. The glory of God has shone about you. Father, it is time for the church to come out of the closet and come out of hiding and begin to stand upon a God and upon a word that is immovable and undefeatable in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, we ask for discernment, a discernment to be able to choose and to see what is lies and what is of the mouth of the enemy and what is coming from the mouth of God. Give us discernment, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. Do this, we ask in your son's name to bring glory and honor to you. Amen. Let me share a praise report real quick. I've told a lot of the classes I've taught in 10 years, there's coming a day when people will call you and come seek you out for what you have. Three weeks ago, a next neighbor who had moved some distance away texted me, I have a son going into the army. He just told me he doesn't want to leave until he knows Jesus. Can we come to your house? Can we come to your house? They came. We had prayed because we had a couple of days to prepare. We prayed. He walked in. I asked him some questions. I shared some scripture. And then we prayed. It didn't take 30 seconds for the Spirit of God to reclaim one that was was dead, but was brought back to life. One that was blind, but now he could see. One who was lame, but now he could walk. There was such a change in his eyes and on his face, and he could not wait to get into the Word of God. He would call me four or five times a day. We would talk Scripture. I want you to know there was one changed who will change many as he goes into basic. Because he told me, I told God, if, if I could know you're real, I'll never look back. He's not looking back. This is what God has called the church to do. Great word. Praise God. Makes you want to take an offering. Amen. I appreciated each one that shared their heart, prayed over these needs. Would you stand with us tonight as we dismiss? Thank you for being here. I would just ask you as you leave this house that you will not leave the responsibilities that we have as believers to pray, to, to pray for one another, to pray for our communities, to pray for our leaders, to pray for our nation. You know, one of the scriptures that has been rolling over my, my heart here lately is, will you not revive thy work in the midst of the years? Remembering mercy, not wrath. I believe God wants to revive our hearts. And so as you leave the service this evening, would you just also add to that prayer list this refreshing that we have coming up Sunday through Wednesday. I've been in contact with Brother Creston Tomlin. He is so, so excited to be here. He travels all over the nation, around the world. I thought it was interesting that one of my good friends 
the pastors in Bartlesville. He was with with this pastor friend, and, and and the pastor asked him, "Where's your Where's your favorite place to minister of all the churches that you you visit that you minister in?" And without hesitation, he said, "I'd love to go to Bethesda." And so he called me. The pastor called me. and said, "You're not going to believe what he just said." And I said, "Well, it's because we still owe him money." <laughs> but you know, there's something about the Spirit of God, the presence of the Lord. It's, it's bigger, th- come on, it's bigger than the facility. It's bigger than us. People love the presence that is here. You bring, you are carriers of the Spirit. And so the last scripture, as we close in prayer, Acts 3.19, repent therefore and be converted, change directions, that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. I want God to refresh this people. I want God to refresh your heart, your family this next week, that, that the, the fire is, is, is kindled and relit within each one of us. And I did a word study on this word refreshing. In the Strong's, it means a recovery of breath. In the Young's, a cooling down. Tyro's, to elevate the pains or to alleviate the pains of a wound by fanning. You know, have you remember as a kid you got to hurt your mom would blow on your ow, your owie? It seemed to feel better. Barclay, refreshing your spiritual strengthening. Lamps to cheer up, to relieve, to revive, to recover oneself. And the original Greek translation of tra- of refreshing, and this is really amazing. It simply means a refreshment stand. Who'd ever thought? like a lemonade stand, come on now, on a hot Oklahoma summer day. That's what refreshing means, is to find yourself at a refreshment stand. And the cool thing about God, there's no cost, there's no charge. You don't have to bring any money, just bring your heart, bring your thirst. So Father, we thank you for every prayer that has been lifted up. We thank you that you are, and have always been, and will always be a good, good father. We thank you that you've heard our cry, that our cries and our petition has filled your ears. And God, you have sent your presence and your word to bring healing and to bring hope into our lives. And God, as was mentioned earlier, may this house be a house of healing, a house of mercy to all that walk through the doors of our building. And may our lives be lives of healing and mercy and hope and love. So bless Bethesda. Grow your church in and through us. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. We love you. God bless you. See you back in service this coming Sunday morning.